Hold on a moment. Okay. So, yes, finally, welcome to our Polar Connect event. And we're really excited that somehow technology might cooperate with us tonight. And we're able to hear um, teacher Jennifer um, Bodalchi. And unfortunately, I think the research Mr. Williams is out doing some field work tonight, but um, they're go she's going to be presenting about the Arctic ground squirrel studies and what she's been doing at Tulik Field Station in Alaska. So um, for those of you that have uh, joined us, um, sorry about the technical issues. It took us a lot longer than we thought to get it going, but you're talking part of the world to the other. So uh, with that, I'm going to go through the presentation, and then I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer here in just a moment. Um, as you have seen, um, the presentation and the slides should be showing up in the center of the screen. There's a list of participants. We ask you to keep your microphones muted. Um, if you joined us by telephone, star six to mute that um, while we go through the presentation. If you have questions, Please type them in the chat area as we go along. There are already some people doing that. Um, this event will be archived, and um, we'll share it with you um, at the end of the uh, in a couple of days. So yeah, make sure you type your questions in, and we'll um, get Jennifer to answer those as we go along. If you haven't done so already, please introduce yourself. Um, I think most people are coming from uh, Europe, but if um, tell us where you're from, um, if you have students and adults, if you haven't done so already. Um, so the reason why Jennifer is in um, Tulik Field Station and in Alaska, she's part of the Polar Trek program. We're funded by the National Science Foundation, and run um, the program is run by a nonprofit that's based in Fairbanks, Alaska, the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. We've been doing this for over a decade, where we place teachers with researchers like Dr. Williams, and um, allow teachers like Jennifer to get hands-on experiences and working side by side with a researcher. Um, we put U.S. teachers with the scientists in both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Um, I mentioned um, questions, and I think Judy typed something in the bottom there as well, but please um, type them into the uh, chat area. And at the end of the um, presentation, we'll try to address them live. Um, we'll see how that goes. If not, we'll just keep addressing questions um, in the chat area. All right, so here's the star of the show. We'll um, turn this over to Jennifer. And I'm sorry that you can't see her right now. The webcam um, takes up a lot of bandwidth, and we want to be able to hear her tonight. So I'm going to turn this over to you, Jen. Hi, guys. I'm so glad that you um, are able to tune in here. I'm so sorry that I can't um, show you the squirrel I have here, but I noticed that somebody asked, um, I don't know if that's Miss Mason or Tommy Mason, I'm guessing. Um, but yes, that is a squirrel, an Arctic ground squirrel that you can hear in the background occasionally. Um, some of you may have seen him earlier when the webcam was working. And if at the end I can try again, I can show you. Um, it's actually a funny squirrel. Um, his name is Orange Orange because he has an orange ear tag in both the right and left ears. And uh, this guy's kind of a jokester. We catch him every day. He loves the carrots, um, can't stay out of the traps. We call that trap happy. Um, today he thought he'd go free, and he did the first time. But the second time we caught him, we decided we would keep him to show you guys tonight. Um, perhaps that will keep him out of the trap tomorrow, but it seems unlikely. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to tell you about what I'm doing here. Um, I'm sorry that I can't be in school with you guys right now, but this opportunity has been really excellent. Um, I've been here at Tulik Field Station for two weeks now, and I have one more week to go. I leave next Wednesday, and it's kind of hard to believe that it's almost over. Um, it's gone by very quickly, but I've learned a lot. And yeah, it's been really great. And you're right, this particular squirrel I see um, is very noisy, Judy. 
Okay, so let's see if we can look through this presentation together. I'll try to remember how to do this. All right, here we go. Can you guys, can you see that okay? Did I switch the slide correctly? Yep. yep. Okay, great. <clears throat> so, um, Corey Williams is the principal investigator on this project. He's the one that chose me for this project, um, and we we're working together. The first week, we were also working with Helen Chimura, who is um, going to be Corey's postdoc in the, uh, starting, I believe, in the new year next year. She's getting her PhD right now, studying songbirds, um, but she came up here for a week with us to learn a little bit more about the ground squirrels. So it was good to work with her as well. Um, and now for these two weeks, it's Then we have lost your sound. At least I have. Yeah, Jen, we can't hear you anymore. Oh, darn it all. So you can hear us, Jen. Oops. And Jen disconnecting from the phone. She probably has to dial back in Skype. We don't hear you. If you hear us, please let us know, Jen. So sorry. We are not having a good internet day. Must be solar flares. <coughs> Darn it. Boy, this has got to be a record. I uh, know. She, she's going to have something go wrong, and I guess it's going to go wrong with us today. <laughs> uh, well, so what I don't know is why she is um, still chatting away. So, um, whoop, okay, we're getting a message. Yeah. Yeah. Please call back in, Jen, to Skype. So her researcher, um, Dr. Williams, is not with her tonight because he's actually out um, looking at wolverines. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of a wolverine. You can let me know in the chat area, but um, wolverines are found in the Arctic, and there's some wolverine scientists that are also up at Tulick Field Station right now. And so Dr. Williams uh, had the opportunity to go look at wo uh, wolverines. So, so just so you know, Jen is trying to dial back in with Skype. Um, however, it's um, not answering for her, so I'm not sure what that means. I was wondering if people can um Tell me in the chat box who has been reading Jen's journal online, because I do know that there is a photo of a wolverine um, mouth, or especially teeth, um, that she has posted in one of her journals. Has anyone seen that? Um, hold on a moment. I heard a beep. Um, Jen, did you, were you able to join us? All right, guys, I'm back. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Oh, good. Skype is okay. I'm not sure what okay, happened. Okay, so um, 
Yeah, yeah. Skype just got done with the phone call, apparently. Um, where did you lose me? Oh, um, you were talking about Mr. W uh, Dr. Williams and... Um, uh, Why he's not here? Yeah. I was telling them okay. that he was at Wolverine, so that's what we <laughs> We went yeah, down yeah, that. No. No, I'm glad. Yeah, I mean, he, I'm jealous. He's he's getting to see a Wolverine right now. It's very exciting. So I'm I'm happy for him. Um, it should be quite a good thing. And hopefully, I'll have pictures to show you later. Okay, but um, just to get into a little bit about um, what he does, he's basically interested in how organisms can adjust their bodies for the seasons. So and over a whole year, and he looks at these um, Arctic ground squirrels as hibernators. Um, they're very extreme hibernators, so they, they hibernate um, seven to nine months of the year, um, seven months typically for males and up to nine months for females. Um, and he's looking to see kind of how they know exactly when to wake up, for example. So the termination of hibernation and the onset of mating, which happens right away after the females wake up from hibernation. Um, and it's part of a long-term study where they're trying to collect um, many years' worth of data so that they can understand what's happening and also understand what's happening in relation to climate change. So as um, in the polar region, climate change is more noticeable. It happens here. So they're kind of looking to see over the long term how these um, animals respond to that change. Okay, so um, let me move on to the next slide. And this is what I was kind of mentioning here. So um, this is a picture of a ground squirrel. You can see that we just saw this, you know, this is what we see every day. Um, but I guess the key things here are that it's a long-term study. So he also has other work going on with things that aren't as long-term. Um, but this one is basically they're collecting data on the individuals in these two field sites over a long period of time. Um, and they're looking at basically how they are responding um, to changes in climate. Um, so some of you might have seen my journal. Uh, recently that talked about the ground squirrels just in general, just gave information about them. Um, but I just wanted to have a little bit of that information here just so we could get to it. Since we can't see the ground squirrels right now, um, I did at least want you to, you can hear this one in the background, um, but they are pretty cool. Um, I mentioned that they hibernate a lot of the time. Um, they live in an underground system of burrows, which are connected, interconnected. Um, they can be quite territorial, but not always. Um, my DP1 class asked a question today um, asking about how far they disperse or how far they travel. Um, and they can move, the males can move up to a, a few kilometers away when they disperse from the area they were born. Typically, the males move away from the area and the females will stay. Um, so they can go a couple kilometers or more, and also in search of females. So they move around looking at this time of year for any females who have stopped hibernating and who are ready for mating. Um, and the females typically stay within a few hundred meters of their burrow system. Um, they go and they dig up roosts, for example, um, to eat at this time of year. But they stay as close, typically, as uh, much closer than the males do. Um, and you can also see um, they are pregnant for less than a month. They have between five and ten pups at a time. Um, and those pups are weaned within about a month's time, so usually um, by July. And the females will already go back into hibernation in August, um, and the males sometimes a little bit longer. It depends on they, – they're trying to put on body fat so that they can um, kind of sustain themselves through the long hibernation period. Okay, let's see. I feel like it's quite cold in this room that I'm in right now in our lab. I didn't realize it was so cool in here in the evenings, and it's quite cold outside right now. It's, um, I think it's the high was around negative 22 today, Celsius. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of cold in here. So I'm sorry if I start chattering like the squirrel a bit. So these are our two field sites that we're working on. 
Most of our work so far has been at East Adigan Field Site, um, which is about uh, 12 or 20, sorry, 20 kilometers um, from Tulik Field Station where we're staying. Um, we drive there every day, not every day, but the days that we go there, we drive in a truck there, um, and then we hike in. And it's right along the pipeline, so there's a big oil pipeline um, that goes quite a distance here in Alaska. Um, it used to only be open to the oil workers, but it's been years now that it's been open for everyone. Um, and so we drove here along that road for eight hours from Fairbanks, and we drive along that road every day, these 20 kilometers, to go back and forth to Adigan. Um, it's really beautiful, and it's, it's the site on the left. Um, the site on the right is close to the field station here, so actually at this time of year, um, we would snowmobile out there. So we've only spent one day trapping there so far this year, um, but we'll be spending more days in the coming week there. It's really covered with a lot of snow at this time, but it, I, I snow machined for the first time, and I found it totally terrifying. Um, I, you know, did not grow up on a snow machine, <laughs> and I do not have a good feel for it. It is not like driving a car. You have to drive this thing with your entire body and really move from side to side. And standing up is probably best, and I am too chicken. So I'm sitting down, and it's very hard to turn. Um, but interesting, so I'm glad <laughs> that I've had a chance to try that. I don't know if you can tell in that picture because it's kind of small, but there's a bunch of white birds on that picture, which I think are interesting. They're called ptarmigan, and they blend in really well with the snow. And in the summer, they will be brown to match the tundra as well. So they molt their feathers and change. And they're also highly um, blending in with their environment. <clears throat> Good evolutionary strategy as a prey species. Much like these, uh, the ground squirrels. So now they're coming up out of their burrows. And they do not blend in. They are brown. The snow is white. But the snow is melting. Um, and they do hibernate most of the time that there is snow on the ground. And then they do blend in very well into the tundra as well. Okay, so let's see here. I do not see anything on the next slide. Okay, don't worry about it. It's there. Um, okay. Just, uh, um, what, sometimes you have to what wait is on a minute. Slide? Sorry? Are, do you have this the slide? slide that's up. Do you have this slide field equipment? So just talk about it. We all see it. Okay, sorry. I just couldn't hear what you said it was, Janet, but I think I can slide down over here. Oh, I see the field equipment. Okay. Um, so yeah, I thought it might be interesting to see um, when we go into the field to do these studies, what we bring with us. Um, so I have this little pouch that I carry around with me. Um, Corey has one also. And we basically, when we hike in, we try not to bring too much extra stuff. Um, but when we walk around the field site, we carry these um, packs with us so that we have everything we need. So, for example, the, the, the um, traps that we're using, if you saw earlier when I picked up the squirrel before the sound was working, um, that's the traps that we use. So we have 80 of those traps right now at Adigan's field site, kind of spread around the field site. Um, we also bring a map with us so that we can actually see um, all of the borough locations that have posts are marked on the map. And this way we can also note down. So if I set two traps at uh, site number 12, I can mark that down. So I remember that's where I should go back to to check that trap later. Um, we carry carrots because carrots are the best food ever, apparently. If you're a ground squirrel, there is nothing better. Um, they, will, they are very trap happy. They love the carrots. Um, more disturbingly, I found that I am starting to love the way my fingers smell when I cut carrots. Um, all of a sudden, it smells like the best dessert in the world, which I find terrifying. Um, but carrots smell sweet. I had no idea. Um, so we bring our knife our carrots, we have uh, pens and tape to mark down. So on the traps, we'll put a piece of tape um, and the location where we caught them, if they're male or female, if they have ear tags, um, anything that we, any information, the time that we caught them and the date. 
Um, we also carry little plastic um, tubes with us to collect poop, which is very exciting. Um, and we make a note on there also with our pens. Um, we carry flagging tape as well, which is, if you can see on that knife, that pink part, um, that helps you. If, for example, if I lose my white knife on the ice, on the snow, I could find it again more easily. Um, but also all of the traps are marked with that kind of pink tape as well, because even though you've marked it on your map, um, it's quite good to be able to visually see it when you're walking towards the trap, because the traps can blend in as well. The pink tape, not so much. Um, and sometimes we bring walkie-talkies with us, depending on how far away we'll be from each other. Um, most of the time I could see Corey, for example, if we're at different places at Adigan, but you can't always shout out to each other. So we carry walkie-talkies if we need them. Um, and I've also created a list of animals that we've caught before, including their ear tag numbers and colors and their um, sex so that we can determine, for example, if it's a male and we've caught him before, we don't need to bring him back into the field, or, sorry, back into the lab. Um, or if it's a female that we haven't, then we will. So we keep track of that so we don't have to bring them back needlessly. Okay. Um, uh -huh, on this slide, these are the data loggers that we're using. So there's four types of basically tiny pieces of equipment um, that Corey and his team use to collect data on the squirrels that we're catching. So just catching them gives us some information, but if they're able to record, basically they're trying to record this information about the squirrels so that they can use it over time. Um, so in the picture in the middle, um, that's showing you a collar. So the black part is the collar. It's actually a, a special kind of zip tie um, that lays flat so it wouldn't be irritating for the squirrel. And then it's also um, encased in a rubber coating, again, to make it smoother for the skin. Um, so they can put these collars on the individuals that they capture, not all of them, but this year definitely um, the females, a lot of them are getting these collars, and they have two pieces of equipment on them. Uh, the one on the left is for measuring light and dark, and that's informative because it tells them whether they're underground or whether they're above ground. Um, because in the summer here, it's light all the time. It doesn't get dark. But when they're in their burrows, it is dark. So the sensor can tell them if the squirrel is above ground or below ground. Um, and it turns out they're really quite regular. They come up around the same time every day, and they go to sleep, or at least underground, around the same time every day. So they wake up around. Uh, I think it was around 7 a.m. and go to bed around 9 p.m. Um, and it doesn't matter if it's fully sunlight 24 hours a day. They keep that regular schedule. And we know that because of these collars. Um, on the right of the collar, you can also see the accelerometers. Um, and this piece of equipment is the largest piece. It's kind of, it, for me, it looks kind of funny on the squirrel, but they're still quite light, so five grams. Um, the squirrels weigh... Some of them weigh between, basically between 400 and 800 grams, depending on if it's a small female or a large male. Um, and at this time of year, when they first stop hibernating, they all weigh less because they've spent seven to nine months not eating. Um, but they're getting fatter every day. So the accelerometer measures movement. Um, it's really very physics-y, and I've seen some of the data that it, um, gives, and it's not obvious to me exactly what it's saying. You have to analyze it. You have to use um, special ways to analyze it. It basically shows up in lines. Um, it can tell if the squirrel is, you know, upright or sideways or running. Um, it measures motion. So they can pair this data with the light logger, for example, and they can see, okay, it's above ground and it's doing this kind of motion, or it's below ground and it's doing this kind of motion. So it's not just assuming that if it's underground, it's it may be doing something underground. And this piece of equipment can tell them that. Um, the body temperature loggers, um, this particular variety of logger is new to this team this year. Um, in this, it's just in the package here because it stays sterile. These are the ones that are implanted into the females. Um, and they measure body temperature. 
And using loggers like this in the past, they found that these squirrels actually, um, their body temperature goes below freezing, so to about maybe minus, I think it was minus 2.9 was the uh, degrees Celsius, was the lowest temperature that they've recorded at this point, which for me is really interesting. I mean, they're getting colder than freezing <laughs> during hibernation. Um, but this is how they're able to measure those kinds of things. Um, and these particular ones are pretty cool because in the past they had to be implanted into the squirrel and then explanted at a later date. So um, when the squirrel was caught again, they would remove the um, device and then they could read it and find out about the body temperature. But now they can actually use a special antenna with these. I would show you, but webcam. Um, and it's pretty cool because it's a circular antenna, and it's the same, it's basically the diameter is big enough to put the entire squirrel through it. So they would just, when we catch the squirrels, we anesthetize them so that they are not stressed out. And so, we, um, and so when they're anesthetized, you can just put them, in, like run them through this um, antenna quickly, and the logger can be read and downloaded very easily without causing more stress to the animal. Um, and they're quite light as well. Um, the final thing is the pit tag. And there's a, a picture of one compared to a penny just to show you size. I didn't, we didn't have any to show you that weren't already in a situation where you couldn't see them. So this picture was from the internet. Um, but it just gives you an idea. And a pit tag is basically the same thing as what would um, be given to your dog or cat to identify them if they get lost. So it's the same piece of equipment. This one's actually from a company called Friendship, which I thought was adorable. Um, but when, when you get your dogs or cats um, chipped, it, it's just read with a little reader that can identify the code. It's exactly the same thing. And um, Melita, good question. It is um, implanted into the back of the neck. I think the same as cats and dogs, basically. Um, oh, does the light and temperature logger also contain a camera? Good question, Sam. No. Um, it doesn't. So there are no cameras, um, except for right now my GoPro. So the science department has lent me a GoPro, and that has been coming up with fun footage, but we don't have anything for, um, none of these pieces of equipment have cameras. Um, let's see. I yeah, see all of your questions, guys. I'm going to try to answer some of them as we go, but some of them we'll answer at the end as well. Okay. Yeah, that's what we've been telling everybody. So just keep going, and um, and we'll get to some of the population stuff. Um, you might also answer some of them in your next couple of slides. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's a good question. I'm not sure that I know the exact population size, but um, Corey was telling me he thought it was maybe around 20 males or so in the Adigan site, um, and maybe, you know, some slightly more females, maybe 30. It's a guess at this point. Um, I don't know exactly, and because um, he's off in the freezing cold snowmobiling, I can't guarantee that that is true, but that was approximately what he thought before we started capturing them again this year. Um, the males have a higher mortality. Um, they, they are out of their burrows more often, um, searching for females, for example, which makes it a little easier to um, pick them off as a prey item if you're a predator, if they're more available. So the females tend to uh, live a little longer than the males do. Um, on the next slide, it's more of a, it's supposed to be a little bit silly, but how to trap a squirrel. Um, basically, um, we look for squirrels <laughs> and we just walk over to them and then we put the traps in the burrows that they've gone down. Uh, not in the burrows, but around the burrows, usually around two traps um, by that exit. There are several exits for a burrow, usually. Um, but some of these squirrels are hilarious. Like, as soon as I walk away, they're up and they're eating carrots. Some of them you never see again. They must go out a different exit and they're a little bit more shy. Um, but the idea, one of the things I wanted to mention here is in my class, I know, um, for example, in DP1 and DP2, when we do ecology, we talk about um, random sampling. We are not random sampling at all, um, but it's because the goal is different here. So in class, when we do random sampling, 
we're looking to get information about an entire population. For example, or, or to estimate population size. We wouldn't catch every single individual, but you catch a certain number of individuals based on an area, and you can predict, you know, like mark recapture or so, and um, you would do all of this randomly, and then you can estimate the population size, for example, or during a chi-square test. You also need random information to figure out associations between species. But we are just looking to get as much information on as many squirrels as possible. So we are trying, ideally, to trap all of the squirrels. They do not all get sensors, um, but they do get, they all get ear tags, they all get colors with their ear tags, and they all get pit tags, and we note down their weight, um, their head width dimensions, um, where we found them, we collect fecal samples, we take blood samples, we are taking DNA from a small ear snip, um, we are also taking fur samples from the females. We're also taking cheek swabs for DNA, which feels very CSI, for example. Um, but we're collecting as much data as we can, so this isn't really a, a random sampling type of situation. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Um, I know it's getting close to the end of uh, class time for single lesson classes. So if you if you do need to um, pop out of this, it's totally fine, and thank you for coming. Um, but I'll get through the rest of this PowerPoint um, for those of you who can stay. Um, so I've kind of already talked through a bunch of this slide, actually, um, the things that we're looking for. Um, in that top right picture, it shows you how we sedate the squirrels. So we bring them back to the lab in their trap, um, and then when it's time to process the squirrel, we will um, First, we put the trap on a table that has a grating so that um, usually they're a little bit nervous at that point, and then they'll pee and poo so that they don't do it later. Um, and it kind of falls through the grates, and we can clean that up later. Um, and then we uh, open the door to the trap, and the squirrel can crawl into this jar, which we then connect a gas to that allows the squirrel to sleep and relax, which is why we want them to pee before they get in the jar. Um, but once they are out of the jar, we can do things like on that, the next picture down um, is the pit tag reader. So for example, we'll run this reader over them just like they can do at a vet's office to see if they, so we can identify the individual from that pit tag that's been implanted. If they don't have one, then we'll know and we can give them one. Um, the next picture shows a measuring of the squirrel's uh, head. Remember, they're sedated here, so they're, they're asleep. Um, the next picture down shows part of the data chart where we record our information. So it's nice. It reminds us what we're collecting and gives every, you know, gives it a place. And there's several lines down, so um, we can where where it's pointing right now. This is where we can record information about the different loggers. Um, there's also information further down about every capture date. So we can look back, and some of the squirrels we caught yesterday were from 2015 was their first capture, for example. So every time that squirrel is caught and data collected, they can record all of that information on the same sheet, and then we input it into the computer later. Um, the final picture shows a blood sample after it's been in a centrifuge. So some of my students will have seen that picture in a diagram form before, so I like the idea of showing you a real one here. Um, red blood cells are the heaviest, and they fall to the bottom, or they spin to the bottom in the centrifuge. Then there's a tiny layer of white blood cells, and then there's a, the plasma above that. <clears throat> so, but it, it basically, it's just kind of this slide talks about all of the information we're collecting from the animals. Uh, once we are done working with them, we just kind of keep them either in our hands or on a heated towel. There's a heating pad under it, which is where we keep them. So you can see that blue towel in some of those pictures. It's got a heating pad under it to keep them warm while we work with them, or we keep them in our hands. And when they start to wake up, um, we just make sure that they, you know, we keep them until they start to wake up so we can make sure they're okay. And then we put them back in their traps with some um, rodent chow and some carrots so they can relax.
Um, yeah, before we do the video, I wanted you to um, answer some of these questions, if you don't mind. And there's a bunch of people that did sign off. Um, Carmen. No, that's, I know. Yeah. And Lloyd. And uh, who else? Yeah, this Carmen. is the time that the, the class changed over. So, um, it's yeah, let's, let's answer questions. So if anybody can stay a little bit longer that we can. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm going to kind of go back up to the top here. So um, students want to know how long do the squirrels live? Um, the squirrels, it's a good question. Um, the females live longer than the males. Um, I don't know an exact, like the longest period of time that they can be alive. <laughs> um, but typically a few years, they'll usually have them, um, so maybe three years, four years, something like this in the wild, they can live longer in captivity. Okay. Um, another question was, how long do they hibernate for? Um, they hibernate for seven to nine months. So typically for males, it's around seven months, closer to seven months, and for females, up to nine months. Okay. Um, another one, class wants to know, what do they eat? Good question. So um, they are pretty much vegetarian, um, and they are eating, at this time of year, they're eating mostly roots, because there isn't much else at this time. Um, but then they will eat other flower, uh, flowers, for example. They'll eat other plant parts, like the leaves, the stems. Um, they eat, a, I, I've read that they can eat mushrooms, too, for example. Um, but they will also eat meat if they come across um, a dead animal or even another dead ground squirrel, um, they will eat the meat from that. I read a, I read some information the other day that said that one ground squirrel found a, a caribou carcass and carried off about almost a kilo of meat in one day. <laughs> Maybe oh store it, <laughs> which surprised me. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty funny. Oh, yeah. Let's see, MYP3Y would like to know what benefits we get from this research and, almost, and also how much does the squirrel weigh? Hello, Yellow. Um, yes, good question. So a squirrel weighs somewhere between 400 and 800 grams approximately. Um, the females, the small females weigh less, the big males weigh more. Um, and what benefits do we get to this re from this research? Um, so we're getting, so there's different ways to look at this. Um, usually before the information can be used directly to benefit humans directly, um, we have to get the information in the beginning, in the first place. So it's helping us create a base of data, so learning more about the organisms around us and how they, how they work. Um, and the idea in this case is that it can benefit us by understanding climate change and also by understanding how organisms respond to climate change. So trying to understand um, internally how they're responding to these things. For example, if you are hibernating for nine months of the year, but it turns out spring starts a little bit earlier because of climate change, it would benefit you to be able to stop hibernating a little bit earlier. So we want to know if that's going to happen and how. Um, and then this information can also be applied in different ways later on. Um, I don't know that definitely with the ground squirrels it applies, but I've read that in some cases, um, some researchers are studying hibernation to look into even perhaps applying it to humans in that if you've been in an accident or perhaps need a great deal of healing after a surgery, um, being in a state like hibernation may help your body to do that. So maybe the more they understand about hibernation, um, the more likely it is to have a medical benefit for humans. Um, that's not directly related to um, the research in, in Mr. Williams and Dr. Williams' lab, um, but it gives you an idea kind of of how this research could benefit us. Okay, good. Um, let's see, from a Lloyd Hacker, um, do you have to recapture the squirrels to remove all the data loggers, or does the material just fall off after time? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, 
so the loggers that we use do not fall off over time, so they do need to be recaptured. Um, the Wolverine team, for as uh, uh, in a different way, they're using similar technology, but theirs do fall off. Um, so the Wolverine collars, for example, are meant to deteriorate. There's like a, a strip that deteriorates over time. I think it's more like a canvas material. Um, and that is meant to fall off at a certain point. And then it has a, a possibility to find it, I think, either by GPS or radio tracking. Um, so, yeah, it, it just depends on the animal and the study. Wolverines are difficult to catch again. Um, they have huge territories, but ground squirrels are where they are. So usually, if that animal is still alive, you can catch them again and recover the data. Okay. Um, and let's see. Um, how many squirrels, this was from Molly Wolf, and I think she signed off, but um, how many squirrels do you collect in one day, week? Yeah, um, so some days we collect, we, we collected one squirrel on two different occasions. Um, and that's funny because that was our first day trapping at Attigan and also our first day trapping at Tulik. We caught one male each time. Um, but some days, I think the most we caught in one day that we kept to bring back to the lab was five squirrels. Um, that was about two days, yeah, two days ago. But we also caught other ones that day, but we had already caught those individuals, so we didn't need to bring them in again. Um, so I would say maybe total, we would catch around 10 squirrels in a day, um, but five was the most that we brought back at one time. And usually the trapping, it's not a full day affair because um, the squirrels, when it's cold, like it is now, or if, it, if the weather's not good, um, they don't come out super early in the morning and stay above ground. So they kind of wait for it to warm up a bit. So usually we get there around between noon and 1 and leave by, say, 5 o'clock or 5.30 in the afternoon. So it's about a half a day's trapping. But then the more squirrels we catch, the more work we have at night. So usually we'll come back, have dinner, and then we come back and then process the squirrels so we can release them the next day. OK. Um, let's see. Um, uh, from Lloyd Hacker, how long do you keep the squirrels in the lab before returning them? Uh, we typically keep them overnight. So the ones from Adigan Field Site, the one that's 20 kilometers away, um, we will process those squirrels typically the evening of the day that we catch them and then release them the following day. Um, there have been, I think, two occasions where we, for some reason, uh, maybe because the collar was not ready. Um, we kept the female to work. So we didn't have the collar at night to work on the squirrel with, but we had everything in place for the morning. So we would did, did the um, processing in the morning and then release them the following day. So basically 48 hours later. Um, but the squirrels here at Tulick Field Station, um, we would process in most cases the same day and then release them the same day again. So they wouldn't even have to spend the night. Um, okay, a couple more here. Um, let's see, how old is the oldest squirrel that has been kept in captivity? That is a good question, and I do not know the answer to that. Um, I can try to, I can ask Corey, and then I can write that on my blog, or on the journal on Polar Trek, so that I can at least have that question answered. Okay. They do, another part of this project, they do keep um, animals in captivity in Fairbanks as well. So I can see if he knows the answer to that. Okay. Um, from Ed Cooper, I heard this type of research may benefit understanding deep sleep hibernation for space travel, e.g. to Mars. Oh, yeah, that's cool, Ed. Um, so, I, yeah, this kind of goes along with what I was saying earlier. Um, so maybe not only with a recovery, but also for keep. I think that's actually really cool. Yeah, so kind of getting people to Mars with such a long journey. So this could be one way to do it, put them into a hibernation-like uh, sleep. And um, since we have a good group of people here, I didn't know if you wanted, and I hear your, your furry friend behind you just chattering away. Um, I didn't know if 
try to turn your web camera back on and uh, show the squirrel before we do the video. Yeah, let me see. Yeah, no, <laughs> it doesn't seem to work. Um, darn it. It's weird. I mean, this webcam almost never worked, but then it was starting to work today, but then it didn't. So I could try to log on to the other computer because that webcam does work. Um, should I give that a go while we chat and see if it works? Um, yeah, I can do um, the show. Well, we need you to talk uh, about this video we're about to see. So let's do that. And then okay. Maybe. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, for those of you that um, in the audience there, I'm going to be showing a video here. And to do that, I have to share my desktop, my screen here. And I'm not sure how this will go, so we'll give it a go. So, Jen, you can talk at the same time. Yeah, so I just wanted to give you, it's, it's a little bit of an idea. Oh, it's going quite slowly. <laughs> um, a little bit of an idea of how we process them. It's not exactly the same, but it's quite close. So. This is Victor's video. Um, he's a grad student of Corey's. I haven't met him, but he allowed us to use this video. Um, this shows you the same type of situation. So he just had a squirrel in a trap, and now that squirrel is in, a, in the jar, the same jar that we use, and it's being connected to um, isofluorine, which is the um, anesthetic. So it's what helps them sleep. So he's just kind of, sorry, it's moving a little bit slowly. So, um, But you can get an idea here. They actually make a little mask for the squirrel. And it's the same kind of thing that if, a, if a, a person was having surgery or something and they put a mask on your face to help you sleep, it's the same. It just fits more on a squirrel. Um, has the video kind of stopped there? Oh. Um, um, it's going on our end, and they've inserted tags. Yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, it's, maybe it's playing slow on my side, but um, basically now the squirrel is anesthetized and they're putting, I think this one is doing, yeah, the collar. So they, they do the pit tags. Oh, no, ear tags they did. Um, so he's looking for information. He's got the squirrel on the gas to keep him asleep. Um, he's looking to put ear tags on if he hasn't already. I can't tell. Oh, no, you can see that they're there. Um, and now he's looking at the... Uh, to make a collar. So he's just trying to fit up the squirrel for a collar that's going to be the right diameter. Um, you don't want it to be too tight, obviously, and you have to account for the fact, depending on the time of year, that the squirrel might put on weight. Um, but you also want to make sure that it's not going to just be able to be pulled off over the head. So it's a little bit of a fine, fine detail. Um, in this case, in, this is a summer video, and they actually do this right out of the back of the truck at the field site. So when they go to Attigan, they don't bring the squirrels back here in the summer like we are now. It's just too cold outside now for us to work with them um, outside. So we bring them here overnight. But in the summer, they have this whole equipment set up right out of the back of a truck, and they just um, can do the work right there wait for the squirrels to wake up, and then eventually um, that same day just bring them back to their burrows. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go back. Uh, hopefully this all comes back for everybody, your PowerPoint. This might be the part that takes a while. Um, did, yeah. um, so while that's loading, we had a couple more questions. Um, it says, from the MYP4 class, is there a difference in sleeping patterns between young and old squirrels? In the sleep patterns, that's a good question. Um, Charlotta and Chloe, thanks for asking that. I do not know. <laughs> 
I, I, that I just do not have an answer for. Okay. Um, it looks like Rebecca signed off, and um, I know you had a few more slides, so why don't you go through and tell us about these things, and then we'll see if there's any more questions um, as we go along. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this slide, just I wanted to show you a little bit about um, where I'm staying and just a little bit about life here at, the, at Tulik Field Station. So that top left picture, that's my room that I'm staying in. Um, I feel lucky because I got a real room, not a tent kind of thing, and also because I don't have a roommate, so it's kind of great. Um, I am staying in somebody's room who's normally uh, working here in the summer months, um, so it's quite nice that his room is open. Um, the building next to it, that is my building. It's called an ATCO building. Um, it's a little bit drafty. My room is the second one on the left. Um, when the heat comes on, it also sucks. Yeah, there exactly is my room. Um, when the heat comes on, it sucks in some of the cold air from outside through the door, which is awkward. Um, so it seems like the coldest times are when it's being heated. Um, but I've also got a space heater in there now. I don't use it at night, but I use it um, when I'm there in the evening before I go to sleep. Um, the picture next to that is my favorite outhouse. Um, so the outhouses are called the towers. And this one is heated and lovely and beautiful, and I love it. Um, there are actually at least three regular toilets and regular bathrooms, but water is a precious commodity here. So they try to encourage you not to use the flush toilets when possible. Um, and this one is lovely. Um, below that, <laughs> which is hilariously misplaced, I guess, is the food. The food below the outhouse is bizarre. Um, not that food, Janet. But <laughs> um, okay, let's <laughs> let's do that one. That is some sort of critter. I think that is a caribou skull um, outside of the lab where I work. There used to be more, but um, somebody's taken them home now. Uh, next to that is the lab where I am sitting right now. It has this awkward problem with Wi-Fi. Um, next to that is one of my dinners. And I just stuck that in there because this place is delicious. It's in the middle of nowhere. Um, my room is kind of cold, and I use an outhouse. But the meals are amazing, and I can't stop eating. And there's going to be problems when I get home and have to fit into my regular clothes. I have basically been wearing elastic pants, um, which works for the field. Uh, that picture on the bottom left, those are other accommodations. These are the ones, they're called weather ports. Um, I think they're going to be quite a lot colder than the room I'm staying in, actually. And they all do come with space heaters. Um, it would have been interesting, and yet I'm happy in the building I'm in. Um, then the other two pictures are just kind of showing you the one there is, yeah, just the area around and beautiful. And the one on the right is the sauna, which I didn't think I would enjoy, but I do, and that's a surprise to me. Um, so that's been quite nice also. And then I think, yeah, the other three pictures are just little snips from GoPro videos that I've taken with the squirrels. These were from squirrel releases. Um, so I just, just to show they're cute if you hadn't seen them yet. On. So you can see I'm all bundled up there. It's, it's cold. Some days I feel like it's like Arctic beach weather, like it's totally warm and amazing and warm with a fleece jacket, for example. Um, but there I've got my polar track hat on and my, you know, big coat and gloves. Um, and then I think in the next two pictures you just get a little bit more cuteness of squirrels as well. Let me see. Can I move forward there? Yeah. So this one's, uh, again, a little capture from a GoPro movie as we release the squirrels. Um, and that's the same one, just a little bit closer. OK. Uh, I see uh, a couple yeah, tags make the squirrels more vulnerable. Yeah, there um, was a question that came yeah. up. Um, from Ed earlier, do colored tags make the squirrels more vulnerable to predation, especially in the snow? 
Yeah, I think that's a good question, Ed. Um, I think the tags themselves, if you can see in this picture right here, they're very small. Um, so the color, the, the number tags are silver and they, they're quite small. Um, and these, like this one's got, it looks like red, yeah, on the ear. Um, it's also quite small. And I think in general, it's not so much. I think the squirrel on the snow sticks out much more than the ear color, um, the tag color on the ears while that uh, squirrel is on the snow. So I don't think it does. Sometimes I wonder about the collars because the collars are a bit, if they have the sensors in the front, they're a bit large. Um, but it seems pretty good. I mean, the females have a lot of the collars and they seem to be, um, they're able to find them again. So that's encouraging. Yeah. And then um, from Cyan, uh, MYP3 Green says, thank you. Enjoy your last week. And Tommy says, so cool, Jen, bring one home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Tommy, I don't think you're doing that. But, <laughs> but man, they are cute. <laughs> um, so speaking of cuteness, if you want to, do you want to, I see that you uh, started up the other computer. Do you want to see your webcam real quick? Yes. Let me see. Oh, can you see me now? Yep. We do. Okay. Let me see if I can get this little guy here. He's been patiently waiting on the floor. Hopefully he doesn't pee on me, but we'll see. We'll see how we go. So this is orange, orange. Um, let's see, maybe from this angle is better. <laughs> Hi. So, so usually this vertical way is a better way to see them. Yeah, we can see them pretty good. Well, you're showing us orange, orange. Ed also wants to know what happens if a predator eats a collar. Um, I don't. I imagine it would just uh, excrete it at a later date, or maybe not excrete. Yeah. It. Oh, yeah. did you hear that chirp? And yeah, I think in, they, they don't. I think they don't eat any, but yeah, I think it would just pass through them. Oh, you guys can't see the webcam. Uh, let's see. I don't know. Let me try. Tell me if uh, I'm going to make you smaller again. Let me see if people can uh, see the webcam. It's a blank screen, they say. Mr. Norris, can you see me now? Oh, this squirrel smells like a male. Like a male. Oh, Mr. Norris can't see you, but Eleanor can. Let's see. Um, Melita class wants to know, did some squirrels ever escape in the lab? That's a good question. Um, not while I've been here, but I think the answer is yes, it has happened. Um, sometimes they'll be working with them. For example, uh, sometimes uh, we couldn't get one into the jar. It just wouldn't go. Usually you just like, you know, give them a little uh, blow on the back side and they run into the jar. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Um, and so Corey would have to take a glove and grab them and bring them into the jar that way. Um, for us, it's never gone wrong, but I think in the past it has, you know, that they have escaped. And then, so we keep the doors closed in the room where we're working so they can only stay in this room and not go to other labs, for example. Um, and then Corey would use the gloves to um, pick them up and put them back. Very cool. I, I like seeing orange, orange. All right. Well, um, I think we've done pretty good considering all our technical issues that we had earlier. So I'm glad you were able to show your squirrel. We were able to hear you. We had some great questions, and it was all pretty good. Oh. <laughs> now some people see you now. <laughs> so I'm glad they can see you. <laughs> yeah, um, I really, I'm, this went a little bit longer than it was going to, and I know that uh, not everybody could stick around for the whole thing. And I really appreciate for those of you guys who were able to tune in and who could stick it out for any period of time. Um, really great to, I can't see you, but to um, read your comments as I could and answer your questions. So it's, it's nice to have you join me here. 
Yeah. So uh, somebody else said, look forward to uh, Tuesday's event. Be safe and have fun. So, um, yeah, I want to thank you, um, Jennifer, for doing such a good job and sticking with the technical issues and so forth. It was turned out to be good. And uh, maybe by Thursday we'll kind of figure out the whole sound thing so you don't have to Skype in. But um, <laughs> uh, for those of you that um, joined us, um, you might not know, but it's almost midnight in Alaska, so um, I'm sure Jen would like to go to bed here soon <laughs> before she has to get up to work <laughs> in the morning. Um, yeah, so thank you. Sure enough. Um, I'm going to stop the recording, yeah. and if anybody wants to open up their mics and say hi, they're sure welcome to do so. Um, but uh, um, it was really good talking to you and seeing you. Thanks so much.